Hello all, Rick here with a look at a ship that appeared once in canon and technically might not come to exist at all considering its place in a future timeline. This is the Universe Class Enterprise NCC 1701J. This ship's origin is a future vessel however, it does come with certain issues when regurgitating the lore and the design behind it as the era it is from is not featured prominently at all. This means that much of the technology and the situation around its creation is lost to us. Nevertheless, there is a small amount to draw from, as well as what can be guessed at from its design development. As such, I'm going to draw on some speculative ideas that were concepts at the time, but we have no way of knowing if they are actual lore of the Universe class. The Universe class was created by renowned Star Trek designer Doug Drexler for the Enterprise Season 3 episode, Azati Prime. Captain Archer had been brought to the future Battle of Procyon 5 by a temporal agent to give context and gravitas to the temporal battle he was waging in 2153. The vessel was never seen in full, only with a Master Systems display panel at a corridor giving the shape of the ship at all, but concepts and design work was done and just never utilised in full. A model created for the show was also a rather rushed job and lacking the finer detail generally required for a featured vessel. Considering it was only a single appearance, this was deemed acceptable but still never implemented. The original design came from the Altair class, which itself was a concept pitched for a starship several times that drastically varied from the classic Starfleet silhouette. The Altair class was made to resemble a delta shape, a narrow V, making it an incredibly streamlined and fast looking ship. It was pitched as one of the concepts for the Intrepid class USS Voyager, and then later the NX-01 Enterprise. Both vessels that were famous in the lore for their contemporary speeds. The Altair featured spindly nacelles and pylons that made it appear fragile, if it were made from modern materials. While this ship never entered canonicity, it was later introduced into Ships of the Lion calendars and a book and is an experimental starship in 2371. The Altair Air class was 324 metres long, 256 wide and only 34 metres tall. Whatever the vessel was prototyping, it never caught on and the USS Altair was the only such ship constructed but still in service for at least another decade. This raises an interesting scenario because we have a prototype that was never iterated on, yet remains in service, presumably as a serviceable vessel in some capacity. This Altair class was given a saucer section, somewhat restoring that familiar profile, and the new kitbash termed the Congo class. However, while this design was not selected either, it would inform the design of the Universe class that was the Enterprise J, and that was amended to better resemble the profile of the NX-01, to further hint at the shared lineage between Archer's 22nd era ship and this new 26th century torchbearer. The nacelles in particular were a point of focus in the design, with them deliberately looking, well, uncomfortably narrow along with the pylons. This was done to evoke the idea that whatever material they were constructed from was far superior to our contemporary metals and probably outclassing even the Federation's prized duranium. They simply did not need to be thick to support the technology within, and were probably a lot stronger than anything Starfleet has displayed so far. Additionally, the idea was floated of them not being attached at all, that the nacelles would be locked into position by some unseen force using technology beyond even this. The idea was scrapped, however, but would see eventual implementation for the 32nd century Starfleet that Discovery eventually takes place in. If I had to guess, maybe some form of quantum entanglement. That seems suitably techno babble enough to justify detached nacelles that don't rely on something as mundane as force fields. As for the names, the J Legacy was simply a whim to place it further down the line of Enterprises, and the Universe class was a homage to the Galaxy class. 
The galaxy class was comfortable heading off to explore the galaxy, so the universe class had a, let's say, wider field of operation. Again, that was the implication. Much of this vessel, from its look to its scale, was designed to stretch the imagination and incite scrutiny because it was supposed to push what was believable for a Star Trek viewer, in many ways placing you in the shoes of Archer if he were confronted with these specifications. So, saying that, this is where I will introduce a speculative section here based on ideas that Drexler thought up but we have no confirmation of in canon. And I'd also like to point out a cool video interview Trekyards did with Drexler on this topic. It's an interesting watch. The Universe class was a multi-role and multi-mission explorer. The incredible size of the ship meant that it could function effectively as a mobile starbase and would arrive at an unexplored sector and act as a hub from which it could launch other ships and begin mapping by itself while other vessels explored outwards. The Universe class was 3,219 metres long, making it over 3 kilometres in length. Internally, while there were turbolifts, site-to-site -site transport booths were more common as a means of traversing the ship. With the scale of the vessel being close to that of a city, zones of the ship were divided up into suburbs, not just the facilities and decks of a standard Starfleet ship. And while the environmental controls were able to support numerous species, they were living alongside each other without incident. The vessel's frame would have been constructed as normal, but the hull was created by a growing alloy that was programmed to organically coat the vessel, which is what gives it the smoother look. This method of creating a hull was basically the precursor to the programmable matter seen in the 32nd century. In the field, this programmable hull was referred to as molecular reconstruction and allowed the vessel to alter its systems to favour defensive, offensive or repair modes as it dynamically shifted to accommodate the role required of it. In term of armaments, it is equipped with phases, I think, type 40? Maybe? I have no idea. One thing that was mentioned is that it does have some form of new particle weapon, something Star Trek Online adapted as the Gravitic Lance, alongside the ability to simply drain aggressive ships of their power using dampening fields and empowering other ships with a complex system of power transfers. Which would be cool to see, to be fair. A vessel that tries to attack is just told to sit down and shut up. It carried many, many auxiliary craft, but the most notable were the Cestus class frigates. Basically the Altair class, but smaller and launched to undertake missions in the same role as a runabout, just larger and functional starships in their own right. In terms of warp drive, we do not know what it was capable of. However, it likely possessed a quantum slipstream drive and a degree of space-folding transwarp locomotion, enabling it to reach other galaxies to explore, hence the Universe moniker. There was also the idea that the ship's computer systems would operate in tandem with the crew's minds, that on some level the crew's brainwaves were tied into the computing power of the vessel and that the ship would in part respond to their wishes when operating it. This would extend to recreational facilities, such as the replacer for a holodeck being a mental version created through a neural device instead of an entire empty holographic chamber. Drexler goes on to say that consoles might not even be required to fly it, although that might frankly be dull. Personally, I think that just because the technology exists to do something, it does not mean it should be done. Plus, paraphrasing Captain Archer again, if Starfleet wanted to explore they could have used probes. But they made starships with crews, so I feel like adding consoles and controls to a starship is just one of those things that would have to exist to give the crew fulfilment in their duty. Overall, 
much of this vessel is unknown, and that fits thematically with the ship's origins too. It was created to seem implausible to a 22nd century officer, and as such most of the technology at play would seem ludicrous to us too. Additionally, it could not be explained in full to someone without violating the Temporal Prime Directive, so it's all likely to remain speculatory until that era is visited in a show. Also, this gives the writers room to not be beholden to pre-established lore, and to be honest, even the ship's existence in tech could be in flux from time travel actions, considering that it was the only instance we ever saw of it, and that was linked to such. I like the design in a strange sort of way, in that I respect that it looks unconventional and indeed like I don't comprehend or understand its form and use. It looks ungainly to me, but as established, that's the point. It's supposed to make you look at it and go, huh. I've been Rick. Thanks for watching this breakdown on the Universe Class Starship. Until the next one, thanks again, and goodbye.